Um, all right, so we're going to start our afternoon plenary. Um, I just want to say there is a change to the program, which is that Andrew Lation couldn't make it. Um, he said he sends his apologies basically because he has to do work in his administrative capacity as the head of school uh, in Nottingham and he's struggling. Um, and he said that it, it was a shame he didn't have a chance to stand up here with Andrew beginning to because he's actually living the experience of the marketization of higher education. So he's um, at the moment trying to uh, struggle with the administration to justify the existence of the geography department at Nottingham. Um, so we're going to all send our good vibes to his good fight. Um, otherwise, th so that will slightly modify the program. So we'll do this uh, plenary from, we'll give uh, the speakers again 20 minutes each and then time for questions. We'll do breakaway um, sessions and then we'll come back um, from four o'clock <coughs> for, uh, for another group discussion and a final kind of report back. Um, if that's okay with everybody. Um, so now we have, um, we're lucky enough to have two very uh, excellent, uh, I guess we can call you activists, is that the right word? I, I uh, suppose, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you're so much more than activists as well, you know, it's about um, changing the kind of intellectual debate, um, not just in, in circles of activism, but in higher education and policy um, circles as well. Um, and these, and I have to say, for those of you who do engage in teaching, I've used both of these books in my classroom and they are a fabulous, fabulous resource for students. Um, Brett's book, I used to teach finance, and Andrew's book as well, uh, in the sense that they're written, they're detailed and very engaging for students, um, but also for myself so, and everyone else who reads them. So we're lucky to have them here today to kind of round out our, our contributions to focus on um, specific issues um, around investment and uh, the private or marketization of higher education. So here we go. Do you want to hold it or do you want to? That thing is probably easier because. How's that? Is that picking up or not? No? The stand weighs a ton. It does, yeah. That's too heavy for the. We haven't got a screwdriver to fix it. Have we? How's that? Is that better? No. Just no. Is it better? How's that? How's that? Is that? Am I picking up that? Okay. Um, thank you, Jonna, for the introduction and the invitation. Thank you all for sticking around um, to the end of this uh, session. Um, I'm going to address the the, the ebook paper that I prepared for Jonna, but because the last few days have been so stimulating, I've kind of scribbled all over it, and I'll probably divert a bit from my from the theme of that. Uh, in particular, I think I'll try and pick up the, the discussion of social investment from earlier, because one of the things that I think might be um, might be less might be hidden in, in the paper as it's written at the moment is the idea that there's something at the moment unique about student loans, but and we perhaps misidentify it because of the shift from the current expenditure funding of higher education through direct grants to institutions through to a fee loan regime is there's actually a kind of investment model at work here and you can in a certain sense see it as investment in human capital. I mean that's and that idea of investment in human capital is the topic of a working paper I'm preparing for PERC that will be separate to this one. So the two things today will be kind of two complementary issues about how do how do student loans figure in the national accounts and why does this drive a move from current expenditure funding to loan creation to loan sale and particularly asset, think about this as an asset class. So one of the things to pick up on, that I'm trying to pick up here on this idea of social investment is that social investment creates assets and what then happens to those assets in asset markets and secondary markets. So one of the things I'm very interested in at the moment is why is the government trying to sell student loans given that it will have to lose more money in order to do that. Um, and that will hopefully come out a bit today that there are distortions in the national accounting conventions. The statistics in particularly the public sector, financial statistics, hide certain things that are central to student loans. They misrepresent them on um, the national balance sheet in a certain sense. And that encourages a sale for, for a number of reasons I'll go into in the course of the talk. So hopefully this won't be too, too detailed on the national accounting. Now I will show uh, a few graphs to help 
to help present this. But really, the, that's the, the sort of the bigger, bigger theme that I'm uh, out to address is that there's a kind of in, a, a transformation going here about what is higher education and what kind of and this idea of new investment and new asset classes, which is not just loans help the government save money, which I think is the narrative people are, are more familiar with. Um, and in particular, the issue is that the Treasury has kind of lost control of student loans. And in particular, the, the deteriorating repayment projections are giving it a series of um, frights. Um, and that the other fundamental thing is it's always been policy to try and sell the loans ever since 2006 7 And the failure to sell is, is, a, is basically a policy problem, though not one that's discussed openly. So I'm going to try and run through what I've outlined here in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, so, as has been the theme so far today that, uh, and yesterday, is that recovery for the Treasury is not just a return to consistent growth or a reduction in the public sector fiscal deficit. It also involves a return of public debt to levels last seen prior to the financial crisis. So this is the last, I suppose if you like, this is the living memory on a certain extent. The Treasury extends a bit further back into the 80s. But what people are looking at is it's very high compared to this recent, recent history. Um, now, if one excludes the financial interventions needed to rescue the banks, and then the public sector net debt, what's known as PSDX, um, currently stands at around 1.5 trillion, or roughly 80% of GDP. The long-term plan here is for growth to reduce the relative standing of that stock, and last year's fiscal sustainability report from the Office for Budgetary Responsibility had debt had those levels returning to what you might think is the Treasury's comfort zone by about the mid-2030s. Um, George Osman has used the term dangerously high in relation to this current debt, um, debt level. And I think what's interesting is trying to work out in the Treasury whether there are any big theories at work. And I think the, question for the, the answer for those of us who've been talking to them is no. But certainly George Osborne leans on Reinhardt and Rogoff at several points tacitly. And that's, that may be something for academics to have a, have a think about. So these are the figures from Wednesday's autumn sorry, I'm using the wrong thing. These are the figures from Wednesday's autumn statement. This is the revised um, forecast for public sector net debt as a percentage of GDP. Red is the new March forecast, and December is the is the old forecast from, from December. That's the trajectory. So this is where Osborne claims his secondary fiscal target will be met because debt is falling as a share of GDP by I think about 0.2 percentage points. Um, I'll say a bit more about that later because this is largely dependent on the speculative estimate of how much cash will be generated from asset sales that haven't yet been sold, including the first tranche of income contingent student loans in 2015-16. So the Treasury View sees, lo sees lowering public sector net debt, achieving three things, uh, lowering payments to creditors, preparing the national balance sheet to absorb future crises and reducing the chances of capital markets restricting the UK's ability to borrow at reasonable rates. Those are the three that I've managed to elicit from them. So when George Osborne was speaking on Wednesday, he said that it, is, it was his central judgment that we will use the resources from the bank sales and lower interest payments and the lower welfare bills to pay down the national debt. We will put economic security first for higher national debt leaves our nation exposed, harms potential growth, so there's the Reinhardt and Rogoff, and costs taxpayers billions of pounds in debt interest. Um, last year, I have the quote up, Nicholas McPherson, who's the senior civil servant in the Treasury, outlined that department's view on debt and provided a little more detail. So I, I really recommend this um, spe uh, speech he gave to the Mile End group at Queen Mary, a series of two papers, one of them given the year before. This is his if you like shared experience on how the Treasury views the economy, I've pulled out this one, one quote here. First, as with any other variables, it's important to take into account the stock of debt as well as the flow of borrowing. The last government recognised this by setting a debt rule of 40% of GDP, the current one by seeking to get debt on a downward path. Capital markets may be more open than they used to be, and so at the margin an increased public sector deficit may be less likely to crowd out private sector borrowing and investment. And it is a long time since the UK experienced a guilt strike but in my view, there will always be inflection points where a further increase in borrowing will result in much bigger increase in funding costs as a number of Eurozone countries have found to their costs. Ex ante, it is difficult to know where these inflection points are, which makes the case for erring on the side of, the ca of caution. And I don't believe there's any bigger theory behind this 
here. I think we're talking about rules of thumb and comfort zones that then return to what we're more familiar with, which is this 40% of GDP target. So in this context, the growing um, contribution, which is explicitly captured now in the national accounts, of student loan issuance to the headline PSND statistic is beginning to have perverse consequences for higher education policy. Uh, the treatment of student loans in national accounts and departmental accounts is unique at the moment, um, but it leads many commentators to misunderstand their workings and what the political implications are. Um, there are three issues arising from national accounting treatment of student loans, and I will discuss them quite briefly here. Um, I have expanded them at greater length in recent and current um, and forthcoming publications, but the three issues are the treatment of loans as financial transactions and therefore exclusion of them from current expenditure. I think this is really important for thinking about social investment. If you want social investment to be presented in, in, in certain ways, you need to be aware that student loans have this structure because they create uh, an asset which generates a future income stream. And because of that, they're treated as financial transactions and aren't in the normal, um, the normal measure of expenditure and receipts. Um, second point is the, the failure of PSND to capture adequately the value of loans as an asset. And I will talk about that to some extent. In some ways, student loans figure in public sector net debt in a distorted fashion. And this makes, means that when governments are targeting PSND, student loans become, a, become um, something that looks better to sell than to keep on the books. And the use of inappropriate discount rates to assess the value for money of any sale of loans. Discount rates is extremely technical. I don't propose to try and explain it today unless people want me to talk about it. I have just written about them for the London Review of Books and how they um, figure. But basically, the issue would be that if you are determined to target public sector net debt and you seek to sell student loans, you're always going to lose money on it because of the government's cost of borrowing. Um, and so the, the, you use an inappropriate discount rate to basically lower the value of... Um, future loan repayments in present value terms so to make a, the price available on any market uh, achievable. If you like, crystallising a, a, a loss for government, a, a much bigger loss than is already expected in the, um, in the student loans. So HE then policy is distorted because the accounting privileges an originate to distribute model for loans, uh, encourages greater economic long run losses through sale at a discount. It becomes an off-balance solution um, with short-term benefits based on financial engineering because this all scores much, much better in the national accounting cash flow. And that means it will replicate the kind of logic seen in PFI. Um, the move would basically be, we used to fund higher education through current expenditure. That moves into financial transactions, so it becomes off deficit. If we can then sell the loans created to the private sector, mainly insurance companies and pension funds, that would then be off balance sheets and we would have reached this technocratic uh, dream, if you like, of funding higher education, but without it figuring in any significant way in the national accounts. We'd, we'd have done more for less from a government accounting perspective. So, just to make a number of points that most of you probably, probably realise, the Treasury is now in the driving seat of um, higher education policy. This was confirmed by McPherson in his talk last year, the same talk. The Treasury's influence has perhaps been greatest in relation to changes in the funding of higher education an area where the UK still has comparative advantage. They're particularly concerned about higher education as an export industry. Um, the Treasury may lo no longer f directly fund the universities as it did until the early 1960s, but it can still change the rules of engagement. For example, the Chancellor's recent removal of the cap on undergraduate student numbers. So this was a Treasury decision, not a decision made by Business Innovation and Skills, which is the department that has nominal responsibility for uh, higher education policy. Um, this relationship is perhaps best exemplified by the new risk sharing agreement foisted on the Department of Business Innovation and Skills by the Treasury. Again, that's a, quite a complicated matter, but basically the Treasury has instructed this to improve repayment rates on, on student loans or see determinate cuts to other bits of its planned spending. This is a small department, so the threats of other cuts to planned spending on top of those uh, en engendered by further austerity is a particularly big threat for that department should it continue to exist after the, um, after the general election. But one of the things to think here, and when I spoke to, this is being recorded, okay, so I need to be a bit, uh, a bit careful. Um, when I spoke to Treasury people responsible for higher education, they said the problem was they had to incentivize BIS to improve student loan repayments. Now, BIS does not control the macro economy, it does not control central bank rates, it does not control the graduate labor market. 
What it does control is the terms of repayment on student loans. So the first thing that's likely to happen is that in 2017, the £21,000 threshold will probably be frozen. I mean, the promise to the Liberal Democrats in December 2010 was that that threshold would rise in line with earnings. Um, if that were to be frozen for a few years, then um, <coughs> repayments would, would improve significantly. But obviously what you have there is a mis-selling issue that you've, people have taken out these loans under certain terms, or, or under, at least under certain understanding of the, the policy. What they don't understand, don't realise is that they sign a clause in their loan agreement allowing the government to vary terms of repayment. Um, that's a separate issue. I've discussed that elsewhere. Um, but I'll return now to the turn to the accounting and what we might think of as the asset structure. How much time? Yeah, uh, seven, eight minutes. Okay. So, is that legible? Yeah. Okay. This is um, student loans are classed as financial transactions that create assets in the national accounts, and that means there's a future income stream associated with them. As a result, the money used to create them and the money that's expected to return in the form of graduate repayments is excluded from normal national accounting categories of expenditure and receipts. Therefore, they don't figure in public sector net borrowing or any other measure of the deficit. Um, they do have an impact on the public sector net cash requirement, which is the driver for public sector debt. Um, what I want to isolate here is the point that expenditure on education has always contributed to the debt. What we have here is the, the formal isolation of it in this structure that you can read now off um, Office for Budgetary Responsibility uh, reports. So this is the table taken from the, the Economic and Fiscal Outlook from March 2015. This is the contribution of student loans to net debt above and beyond what's in the deficit. And you can see the basic structure here. We have new loans issued, 12 billion this year, rising to 16.5 billion in 2019-20. This is UK, not England, but mostly England. Uh, and this is repayments. So this is repayments from all loans issued since 1998. Currently struggling along at um, 2.3 billion, rising to about 2.6. And then here that decreases because they're expecting they've sold some of the loans to the private sector. So those repayments that were in the projections are now going to purchases. But you can see, and this is something that James talked about, is there are a number of indicators which point to a weakness in the economy. This repayment data is extremely weak, given that we've had nearly two decades of loan issuance. What are graduates repaying at the moment is not very, not very much. <clears throat> but you can also see that there's a shortfall each year, effectively. That's the cash requirement. So 10 billion this year, 11 billion year after, 12, 13. All of that has to go on to... Uh, all of that has to be got from, through borrowing. It just doesn't figure in the normal measure of, measure of borrowing. Now, my point isn't to say, wow, education's expensive. Well, what are we doing here? We should boost these repayments up. What I want to think about is this is a formal asset structure, an asset and liability structure, uh, in terms of this notion of investment. Importantly, what the loan enables you to do with higher education is say no upfront fees. Now, this is the difference, I think, with a number of the... Uh, a number of these ideas of social investment is here we already have fees in the system with other things where social impact bonds for example may w work better there isn't a fee structure the important thing here and you might if you Colin in the back thinking about the National Health Service if these stress is on up front no upfront fees what we're talking about maybe in other sectors is a loan structure like this where everybody in the first degree has access to the loans but this is now formally captured in a different way in the national accounts so, the other thing just to point out here, um, probably running out of time, look at the size of this. When David Willett says universities could buy their own student loans, this is 12, this is, you know, 12 billion pounds every year. Universities do not have the balance sheets to purchase these loans on their own account. Now, the, used, the joke used to be that you know, Harvard and Yale are endowment funds that do a bit of teaching and a bit of research. The UK, don't have, UK universities don't have endowment funds. The funds that might help universities purchase their own student loans are money funds, you know, insurance companies and pension funds. And we simply don't know what kind of institution would result if a university teams up with a fund of that kind to enter into a deal to buy their own graduate loans. It would really just be you know, beyond anything that we currently have a grasp on. So some of the things that look like solutions to the problem at the level of 
pure current financing engender these long-range problems that are much more ambivalent and hard to assess. Um, that's probably the wrong way to put it. They're just basically dangerous. And we need to be, we need to be looking at this in the long run and, and acting a bit like, what's the worst-case scenario? Because the worst-case scenarios could arise, I think, in these kind of, in these kind of structures. OK. So this is a kind of point where the accounting, I think, becomes critical, because the accounting has enabled something to happen or encourages something to happen. Um, I'll skip over this. Now, the, the, thing to, the thing I can find quite interesting at the moment is technically it is not government policy at the moment to sell student loans because Vince Cable vetoed it last summer. But in all of the projections from the OBR, the sale's still in there, and they've been told by government that it remains policy. Now, it's whether that's the Treasury or the Conservative Party, we don't really know. In the one sense, George Osborne is able to claim that debt will be falling as a share of GDP because we will have sold loans next year and we will have raised £2.3 billion from the first tranche of sale, but it's not currently government policy. That puts us in a bit of a strange situation. I think all of that stuff that came out on Wednesday on asset sales is, is entirely misleading. Okay. I just thought I'd show you this because this is the other side of the asset structure. Um, so this is, a, again, OBR from the Fiscal Sustainability Report 2014. This is the cash flow projections for student loans. So out here we have 2040. This is the point in which you imagine we've been issuing loans of this kind of order for the next two decades. At that point, we will kind of hit operational maturity. This is when repayments will kind of plateau. This is in percent of GDP, but it's probably about eight, seven to eight billion in today's money. Until then, you have to borrow to front load the scheme to get it up and running. That's this. Sorry. That's this shortfall here, and this thing. Project those out into the future. This is the problem. This bit here is kind of loan funded. You have to borrow in advance to get it up and running. Um, just to show you the two, two aspects of this, apologies for, my, um, for the presentation here. I kind of, I've only been working with this data relatively recently. This is the projected total balances on outstanding student loan accounts. So you're issuing all these loans for several years. Um, these are all quite fantastical, but this gives you an indication of the kind of commitment that's being undertaken with the move to a fee loan regime. These are billions uh, on the account. This is how much all graduates will owe to government in nominal face value terms. Um, sorry, um, face value terms. This is it in uh, today's terms, so 330 billion. But we will cross a trillion in cash terms in, in 2045. If you like, this is the asset side. Now, if you're thinking about assets, this is money owed to the government or owed to the private purchaser. Um, and then the other side is the liability side. And this is the impact on public sector net debt as a percentage of GDP, again, projected out into 2040s and beyond. Now, the red indicates that it's the loans issued since 2012. This is in, these last two are just England only. This is the loans issued before 2012 and their contribution. So the government has to borrow to create the loans, and then it has the asset and it has this liability. Um, this is going to peak at 10% of, uh, well, 9%, sorry, of GDP. If you include loans to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, it peaks at 10%. Um, as I said, on the OBR projections, public sector net debt's meant to um, decline to the comfort zone by about 2030, when it will be a, they think it will be about 50% on the projections they've been given by George Osborne. The borrowing used to create student loans will be 20% of public sector net debt at this point. And that means, I think, loans will be in, you know, loans are already in the Treasury mindset in a different way. But this is a, you know, a huge shift in our understanding, thanks, of, the, um, of what's going on. Now, the important point, to, important point to stress here, and those of you who are more tuned to the national accounting have probably already spotted this, it's hang on, hang on. How can, if this is the asset and this is the liability, how come it says impact on public sector net debt up here? Because if it's net debt, the asset and the liability should be netting together. Um, well, it's because of the way the statistics constructed. In, in the public sector net debt, the asset side of student loans is excluded. Only the liability side is in there. So when you, when you think about student loans' contribution to the financial health of the country, you think, well, there's an asset and there's a liability and their value balances out. When we look at public sector net debt as a specific 
statistic that's targeted by politicians, it's the way they present macroeconomic competence to the public, is whether they hit this target or not. Only the liability side of student loans is in there. Only the borrowing used to create student loans is in there. So if you sell the student loan, you get cash for the asset, but that cash can then be used to pay down public sector net debt. This is the same structure behind almost all of the asset sales that were announced on Wednesday. They're all illiquid assets. The Lloyds Bank shares, the, Bar the Bradford and Bingley structure, student loans, they all have this same feature. Only the liability is scoring in public sector net debt. The asset side isn't there. So if you change the asset into cash, you improve the statistics. Now this is a, you know, I think this is a big presentational problem. It's, you know, you're basically not improving the financial health of the country if you sell an asset for what it's worth. You're just swapping the asset for the cash it's worth, effectively. But if it's not figuring properly in the statistics, then it's going to encourage you to do do certain things uh, to sell. Still, what, a minute? Shall I wrap up? Okay. So, since loans are considered to be a liquid asset, their value does not net against the borrowing used to create them and the calculation of PSND. So, although student loan creation has a larger and larger impact, it's also skewed and misrepresents the overall financial position of the government. With governments targeting this measure as part of their fiscal mandate, these presentational distortions have consequences. Most of the assets announced for the 2015 sale have this same feature. And note that Labour announced its 6,000 tuition fee um, policy with reference to the impact on PSND, not in terms of the overall economic cost or any other vision, but it would be 10 billion lower in 2020 and then 40 billion lower in 2030. Um, and this is the repeated pattern of the discussion of loans and the justification for the sale of loans, is it's the short-term benefits, when what you're effectively doing is swapping future cash for cash, cash today. Um, <coughs> so all of the kind of apparatus of um, the political presentation of the economy is, is built around these sort of five-year projections, which in terms of loans are completely inappropriate because these loans have 35-year lifetimes. The lost income, 20 years, 30 years down the loan, which you've done because you've sold, sold it to a private investor, is not showing up in the scorecards. What's showing up is the fact that you've got some cash today which you can use to pay down PSNDs. All this stuff is, is sort of disappearing from the, presentational, the presentation of the decisions. Okay, I said I wasn't going to talk about the discount rate, and I don't have time, so that's good. But I think there's a, there's a sort of issue here around, firstly, what are the alternatives to these statistics? I think that's something we need to take quite seriously. Is we've, everyone knows about the suspicions about GDP. I've shown you some problems with PSND. If PSND as a percentage of GDP is what's presented, I think it's important to create these decisions. I, the thing about discount rates is quite um, important, and I'll, say it, I'll just say one thing about it. Loans are getting distorted for a variety of reasons, one of which is there are, this long, there are these long-range implications, but all of the presentation is kind of short-term at the moment about macroeconomic competence. If you put the discount rates in here as well, you have, a, you have a, an additional problem. Um, but I'd just say that this, this problem of failing to think the future through economic policy, um, Roy Harrod said that you know, the discount rates are the polite expression for the rapacity that the present displays towards the future. And I think this is a similar sense here, is that with, with loans, we're effectively turning the future into something that looks like a, a kind of quantified, priced asset quality, even before we sell it or not. And, you know, I'm someone who in a previous life used to spend a lot of time reading Walter Benjamin, and this is really, if you look at government spreadsheets, this is the sort of projection of empty, homogenous time into, into perpetuity. I mean, these things go out into 2060 as if nothing, nothing's going to happen. So I think there's a kind of bigger issue here about um, you know, the, the, the sort of alternative ideas which some people have already kind of captured today around the economy. The problem is, because there's this general absence of vision, it's these kind of, this accounting has come to prominence. I'll conclude by saying, you know, even last week Vince Cable said, I wish we could do the accounting differently to capture some of this, you know, the investment in education and things. The problem is when we do do it differently, we're leading towards turning things into, turning things into assets. And the, the bigger issue is surely, why is the accounting driving the policy? Why is it the deficit and the debt, this media macro, as Simon Ren Lewis says, um, so dominant? And I think that's really because there's a sort of failure to put across and convey alternative understandings of these things. Excellent. Thank you. Shall I switch it? Yeah.